Steps into it. Pass is caught. Sideline. Touchdown. Unbelievable. Vikings win it. Hello, hello, let's go. It's your man Flip Mozzie, and thank you for spending 15 minutes with me today. We are on the other side of the magical third preseason game, the quote-unquote test run, the best indication of what's to come, and by best I mean not at all. You know what? I was so excited for this game that I didn't even watch. Well, that's a lie. I watched. I just didn't watch it live. Should we feel good about what we saw? Should we be down in the dumps? My answer to that is ain't nobody got time for that. Who cares? We're still looking forward here on the pod to the regular season. That said, we do have some stuff that have real impact on the 16 games that matter. We have a kicker that missed two field goals. Wide left. Sound familiar? This this Dan Carlson guy, uphill battle, man. Most young guys, we love them. Kickers? Nah, we ain't about that. We're Vikings fans. Dan's going to have to prove it to us. Make 86% of your field goals, 90% of your PATs, Dan. Prove it to us. And that still probably won't be enough. We'll never trust that kicker position. Also, we have two new Vikings. First, our team brings in George Eloka for under 800000 this year. Eloka is an old Zimmer disciple, a big-bodied safety from Boise State. He gives that talented Viking secondary yet another piece and comes with some previous understanding of Zimmer's complex scheme. And Rick wasn't done. He sends a seventh-round pick to his buddy Pat Shermer for Brett Jones. Fans clamored for offensive line help all summer. Well, here it is in Jones, who has 14 games starting under his belt and played time at both center and left guard. Center help now, left guard help later is what we're hoping for. Many are raving about these moves. I'm a bit more reserved. Cautiously optimistic that Aloka will be a positive signing, but it's tough to read just how much he'll play behind the good old boys Harrison Smith and Andrew Sendejo. Jones got straight up beat out for his job in New York. It's hard to know how fast he can get up to speed. What's good here is the value. We don't need massive improvement, just some nice wins on these two moves. Now, moving on to the juice of this podcast, our four biggest games of 2018. Ranking teams on the positions that could hurt our purple the most. Quarterback, second receiver, receiving running back, defensive tackle, and defensive end. I covered the nine other opponents in the last pod. It's time to focus on the top of the heap and finish our preparation for the regular season. Coming in at number four, finishing just off the podium in these rankings, now is where we talk about the revenge game. The week five showdown with the defending Super Bowl champions. Philadelphia won their Lombardi with plenty of wind left in their sails. While the core of their team remains, the roster did change, and that's what caused them to slide to number four right now. Beyond losing both offensive coordinator Frank Reich and quarterbacks coach John DeFilippo, we're looking at the players on the field. Carson Wentz, even if he isn't healthy week one, you gotta think he's back before October 7th. Wentz was a phenom last year. He finished second in QBR, sixth in DVOA before his ACL injury. That went down in week 14, but not before he threw 33 touchdowns and only seven interceptions. Ridiculous. Any return to form or continued development from Wentz makes the Eagles a force. While Wentz is a huge strength for Philly, their skill positions, I could see our D faring better than they did in the playoffs last year. Give us another crack at Xavier Rhodes on Alshon Jeffrey. Yeah, Zach Ertz is real legit. Mike Wallace could be an upgrade over Torrey Smith, but Jay Ajayi doesn't scare me. Maybe Corey Clement could threaten if they give him more of a role this year. But now we definitely got to watch out for Philadelphia's front four. Fletcher Cox and Tim Jernigan led the Eagles to 2017's number one spot in line yards allowed. And they added Haloti Nada. Now, the stats don't support their edge rush to that same level. Their sack rate was 19th last year, but man, they got some names. Brandon Graham, Derek Barnett, and another newcomer, Michael Bennett. Philadelphia is stocked, but so are we. I can't wait to clash against them again this year. 
taking the bronze medal, we stay on the East Coast and visit the Golden Boy in our Week 13 matchup against the New England Patriots. It's crazy that we're facing both Super Bowl teams from last year. At this point, it's impossible to think that New England won't contend as long as they have Bill Belichick coaching and Tom Brady at the helm. Brady is just so legit, y'all, year in and year out. Dude was 5th in QBR last year, 2nd in value, 1st in adjusted line yards. Filthy. It doesn't matter who his receivers are, and that's good because they don't have much. Brandon Cooks is in LA, Danny Amendola is in Miami, I respect the Gronk, but Julian Edelman shouldn't be a problem, neither should Chris Hogan, and especially not Cordero Patterson, that guy had 31 catches last year. Now we do, we do need to worry about James White and Rex Burkhead. They're among the most effective pass-catching running backs in the NFL. Burkhead was 8th in receiving value and White was 20th last year. For comparison's sake, Jarek McKinnon was 30th. To stop New England, you have to put pressure on Brady at all costs or he'll eviscerate you. And when you pin your ears back, they have capable backs to beat defenses on screens, swings, dump-offs, and slants. Ugh. Defensively, I mean, their front is all right. They finished 10th in sack rate, and adding Adrian Claiborne from Atlanta can only help. But I mean, you can run on New England. Their defensive tackles aren't good. We beat New England by getting an early lead, eliminating turnovers, and controlling field position. That's easier said than done. There's only two teams left, y'all. We shouldn't be surprised that the Los Angeles Rams and New Orleans Saints finish above the Eagles and Patriots in these rankings. We're looking forward, not backwards. The Vikings are built impressively, but they're not the only ones. LA has made serious moves this offseason. They're number two on this list. Unlike these other teams, the Rams' main strength isn't at quarterback, it's at running back. Todd Gurley is coming off a career year with 2,100 yards from scrimmage, 19 touchdowns. Almost 40% of that production came when catching balls out of the backfield. No back had more than his six receiving touchdowns. In this modern NFL, Gurley is one of the best RBs in the league, no question. Up there with Le'Veon Bell, he finished fourth in rushing and seventh in receiving value. The highest rushing success rate of 2017, too. He's the engine of their offense. And that's a good thing, too, because there are still plenty of questions about Jared Goff. Goff improved massively from his rookie year, but his QBR was still just 52, mediocre. Smartly, the Rams have done everything they can to ensure their quarterback has the proper weapons. Brandon Cooks gives them a potent primary receiver. We care more about Cooper Cup and Robert Woods. Cup finished fourth in receiving value. Waynes and Alexander will be tested in week four. So too of the offensive line. Now Aaron Donald, the league's best defender, may or may not be back. I'm guessing he will, and he'll be next to Indomitian Sue. That's a crazy front that causes more havoc in the all-important pass game than the run game. LA finished second in sack rate last year before adding Sue. You have to assume Los Angeles forces us into more two tight end sets to cope with those awesome defenders. Now, for the biggest threat of 2018, Week 8 Sunday Night Football at home against the New Orleans Saints. Let me be clear, this was an easy decision. They were a clear winner in my rankings, and while the NFC has a bunch of stiff competition, the 2018 version of New Orleans, even though they lost to our Purple twice last year, had the best matchups against us. They had the elite quarterback to compete against our defense. Drew Brees has been doing it for 17 years and still had his best ever completion percentage in 2017. His third straight year above 100 quarterback rating, but his QBR was low, 11. Meaning what? He had a ton of help last year. Alvin Kamara was a flat-out stud in 2017. First in rushing value, sixth in receiving. The dude has more receiving yards than rushing. Basically, your third or fourth receiver who can line up anywhere. A full-time Percy Harvin. 81 catches, 826 yards, 5 touchdowns. 6.1 rushing yards per attempt. He's a nightmare matchup. Then, 
Everyone loves Michael Thomas. The Saints have good receivers behind him. They're being slept on. The start to Ted Ginn's career was slower than expected. Now here we are 10 years later and he's got three straight years above 700 receiving yards. There's nothing wrong with that from your second receiver. The speedster finished second in receiving value last year. It's going to be fun to watch him and Wayne's battle again this year. Behind him, everyone has forgotten about Cam Meredith. He was basically the Bears' best receiver two years ago before tearing his ACL. Any return to form presents another threat. The Saints offense has speed all over the field. Also, the Saints finished 6th in sack grade in 2017. Cam Jordan is one of the best edge defenders in the game, and New Orleans traded up to draft Marcus Davenport to put a cross from him. If they can disrupt like they did in January, there's going to be problems there too. To beat the Vikings, you need a great quarterback, a versatile running back, a deep receiving core, stellar pass rush, and staff defensive tackles. New Orleans is great at almost all of those things. To bring this all together and finish the season preview, here we take a look at the schedule. Our man JR hinted at it last week. It could be a slow start for this Vikings offense. There's a lot of moving parts there. You had the new QB Cousins, Cook coming back from injury, new coordinator DeFilippo who's installing a new scheme, all while dealing with a rookie offensive tackle, center will have been here two weeks, and new offensive line coaches. That's a lot of adjustment for one offseason, so we can expect a gradual progress on that side of the ball. Hopefully our purple can hit their stride by week four. That's a very important date. We'll get to that in a bit. But overall, I think the offense will look more like 2016 rather than 2017 over the first few weeks. Now, will that affect their wins and losses? Well, they went 5-0 in 2016 during that time of adjustment. So that's what we're hoping for. Another area where I think we can prepare is identifying trap games. I have a heavy circle around week seven. They play Arizona, which I'm high on in week six, and the Saints in week eight. Both of those games are at home, so it'll be easy to look past the trip to New York to play the Jets in week seven. Some will point out the week three contest against Buffalo as well. Zimmer will have to keep his men focused before the winner comes. Thankfully, the schedule clears up in December. If we can get to week 14 above 500, say 7 and 5, which is pretty reasonable, you have to like the chances of making the playoffs. They finish the year with Seattle, Miami, Detroit, and Chicago. This is a setup for a late season run, so just hold on until then. And yeah, that late spurt will be needed because it's a rocky road mid-season. Things get especially tough in prime time. The first big stretch of the season starts on Thursday night against my number two opponent, the Los Angeles Rams. The offense must come online before week four. Then, thank goodness, our Vikes get a long week before playing my number four team, the Eagles, in a late afternoon battle. America's game of week five. After that bout, my sixth-ranked opponent, Arizona, comes to U.S. Bank Stadium. I don't think that game will be an easy one. The next challenge is just a two-game dance in Week 12 and 13. Green Bay comes to town on Sunday night football. Then Minnesota travels to Foxborough for another late afternoon game. Hopefully their last big game of the year. Let's go win it! That's what the full season strategy looks like, guys. Grind to pick up wins with good defense until the offense gets up to speed. Battle through the meat of the schedule. Be great on national television. Finish the season strong against beatable opponents. With that, I hope y'all enjoy the season preview. From here on out, I'll be coming to you with a weekly game-by-game focus for each 2018 game. The build is almost complete. They'll shape the roster and turn all focus towards week one, September 9th. Vikings vs. 49ers. That's right, the next pod will be a regular season pod. Until then, we're gonna shut it down.